Okay, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to uh, today's CNCF webinar, Puma, Service Mesh and the Future of Application Connectivity. Uh, I'm Ariel Jatib, I'm a business development the business development manager for cloud native technologies at NetApp and also a CNCF ambassador. I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar uh, and would like to introduce uh, today's presenters, Marco Palladino, CTO and co-founder at Kong, and Kevin Chen, a developer advocate at Kong. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not going to be able to talk as an attendee. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many of those uh, as we can at the end. Uh, this is an official CNCF uh, webinar and as such, uh, subject to the CNCF's code of conduct, please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Uh, basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Um, please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page, cncf.io forward slash webinars. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Marco and Kevin for today's presentation. Hey, thank you so much and, uh, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Today we're going to be talking about Service Mesh, Application Connectivity, and Kuma. My name is Marco Palladino. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Kong and uh, I'm joined today by Kevin Chen, uh, who's a developer advocate at Kong. This session is going to be split in um, two different parts. Uh, there's going to be uh, my presentation, uh, and then we're going to be seeing a live demo of Kuma. Uh, Kevin will lead that effort. So today we're going to be talking about Service Mesh, and to really understand why this is the time to talk about this new pattern, we need to zoom out and take a step back and understand that we are really entering and we have entered since a few years a new era of software development we have transitioned away from large monolithic applications that were baking all of the functionality and all of the features in one in primarily one code base and we started to decouple and distribute those large code bases into smaller decoupled services these services are going to be powered by an API uh, because they're separate. We're not going to be using function calls in our monolith to consume different parts of our application, but we're going to be making calls over a network to do that. And really this transition from monolithic to microservices um, was started by a few technologies that came out in 2013 and 2014. One of them is obviously, obviously Docker, which popularized the adoption of containers and the other one in 2014 was kubernetes which gave to everybody else to the entire industry a platform that anybody could use self-service to deploy our applications some companies have done this transition prior to kubernetes of course i mean microservices they really exist and they have been existing for a long time if you if we think of Google internally, first and foremost, but also Amazon, companies like Netflix, they did transition to microservices prior to Docker, prior to Kubernetes. The difference is they had to build their own tooling from scratch in order to be able to do that, in order to be able to run those microservices. But after 2013, after 2014, there is a new ecosystem that's, that's coming out in the industry that provides this tooling out of the box for everybody else. So we don't have to build our own monitoring solutions. We don't have to build our own orchestration platforms, but we can um, go on landscapes, ecosystems like CNCF, and then get the software we need without having to build it ourselves. In this sense, 2013 and 2014 were pivotal moments in the industry and created this new technological transformation in the world, a new era, effectively. And, and really, this transformation reconnects with pretty much every other technology transformation we're doing in the world. Uh, at the end of the day, the goal that we have, I have, you have, everybody has really, is to grow the business. 
And to grow the business, it is important that we can capture new users and we can monetize the existing ones. We can provide a better, more reliable digital experience. As a result to that, we're going to be making our applications more uh, reliable. We're going to be distributing them. We're going to be decoupling them over time. We're going to be leveraging different regions, different cloud vendors even. We're making our software more distributed and more decoupled in order to make our development speed faster, to make our services, our entire experience more reliable. So as we're transitioning from centralized to decentralized architectures, we're really transitioning from uh, a more static, if you wish, uh, sort of architectures, you know, monolithic apps that you deploy all at once, you know, multiple people, all the teams working on one code base, to a more dynamic, to a more elastic, if we wish, architecture. We can decouple these services, we can deploy them independently, we can build them with different technologies, we can deploy them without too much coordination across the different teams. As we do that, the number of services increases over time in our systems. It's inevitable from large monolithic applications to smaller decoupled microservices. As the number of services increases, well, we're introducing some new challenges that we didn't have before. And one, some of them are more control, more visibility on our overall architecture. In, monolithic, in the monolithic world, we had a handful of systems running. At the end of the day, they were hard to scale, they were hard to build, but it was just a few of them and we could deploy them very well. In microservices, these get harder because we have much more, the scale of, our, of the things that we have running increases to a much, much bigger scale. And as we are decoupling our monolithic applications in microservices, we are also introducing a new variable into our architectures that was always existing even before microservices, but now becomes, becomes a much bigger, bigger component, a bigger part of these modern architectures. And that is the network. As we are decoupling our architectures into separate services that we can consume via an API. And by the way, the API, it's not necessarily just an HTTP API. It can be any API with any protocol um, uh, that runs over the network. Uh, it can be gRPC, it can be a Kafka event, it can be a Kafka stream, it can be the, a more traditional service to service request, it can be anything. But the point is, we're going to be having APIs that are, we're going to be accessing on a network and when we do that, we're making the network and the network reliability part of the overall picture in a much bigger way than monolithic applications. The network, as we all know, is not secure. The network is unpredictable, can be slow at times. And so when the network becomes such a bigger part of our overall ar architecture, problems in the network are going to be affecting our end experience in, the, in, in bigger ways. And again, this is part of this transition that we're doing from running everything on a CPU, you know, we're effectively replacing the reliability of the CPU with the unreliability of the network. We are replacing our function calls, our objects in a monolith with network calls. Now, we always, always had network calls even before this, you know, even in a monolithic world, the monolith, if anything, was consuming a database. And that was a network request. And, and if that network request went down, then the monolith was down. What has changed now is the scale of those network requests. And really, we are having man, many more network operations and network calls and network requests overall in microservices than we ever had with monolithic applications. The network, this is the keyword service connectivity over the network. Now the network is a problem because like we said, it's not secure. We need to encrypt the network. We want to be able to build uh, zero trust security models by assigning an identity to every workload that, are, that runs in the network. If a service wants to consume another service, we want to make sure that the service is first and foremost uh, a real service. We can verify the identity of that workload. And then we can then um, guarantee a permission to consume other services. We want to be able to set up ACL rules that determine what services can consume other services. If we have a very restricted um, service, for example, that 
is exposing sensitive data in for user information, we don't want every service perhaps to access that, that specific service. We want to be able to set up rules to determine how we're going to be segmenting our traffic. Services are going to be having different versions. There we're going to be having uh, feature flagging requirements. So we want to be able to enable some features only if certain services or certain versions of our services are making those requests. We want to implement some complex routing and versioning over the network. In a monolithic application, we would either create a new implementation of a cloud, of, a, of an interface, or we would redeploy the entire thing over, over and over again. But with microservices, because the our application, the overall application is not in one place, but it's made of these services running all together and different versions of these services running together, we need to have something that allows us to determine what is the behavior of the network in our system. Uh, we want to be able also to deploy our services in a safer way. We want to implement the canary releases. We want to be able to observe all of this network connectivity that's going from one service to another. We want to be able to, be able to collect metrics, to log all the requests and trace them so we can find bottlenecks, so we can find where the problem is. Um, in microservices, performance also becomes a much bigger requirement. Um, in a monolithic, you know, monolithic applications, they had you know, many flaws, but at the end of the day, invoking a function was quick. The underlying uh, you know, Java virtual machine, for example, was quite quick to consume objects within the context of the JVM. But with microservices, we're not doing that anymore. We're making network requests that go to the outside world, to the outside, outside of that microservice to consume another microservice. Therefore, um, that performance, it's much more impacted by the network. And so we want to be able to trace that network. We want to be able to observe it in greater and better ways. There's a whole set of concerns that we need to take care of. Um, and, and, you know, traditionally, even in monolithic applications, we would have the network, right? And traditionally, we would be writing more code. The application teams would be, would be writing more code to take care of this network. So we would write smart clients, for example, that would perhaps retry a request to the database, maybe, if that request failed. It, they would log the exception. They would log uh, any problem that the network experienced. The problem is that as we are transitioning away from a few handful of large code bases to more and more microservices, um, we want to be able to implement this network management across the board, not just in one place, but on pretty much every service. And so over time, the problem is that each team and each application and each service, if we don't do anything about this, each service will then implement in one way or another, their own smart client or their own network management. Over time, this creates lots of fragmentation, especially if we're going to be using different programming languages across the board, because then we have to re-implement this logic ac across different languages. Um, this creates lots of fragmentation and creates um, uh, lots of problems, including security problems, compliance problems, um, you know, uh, observability, um, uh, incompatibility across these different services as different teams are going to be creating this extra code to manage the network. The teams should not be managing the network. The same way we don't ask the application teams to manage the data center, we give them an abstraction that they can use to deploy their services. Likewise, we want the application teams to focus on creating the service, not on managing the network. If they do manage the network, this will inevitably lead to fragmentation and poor implementations. It's not their job. Their job is to manage, is to create the service, the end uh, user application, and make sure that that experience is reliable. But managing the network is a side job that today they're implementing themselves. Right? And we don't want them to do that. Um, you know, if we manage the network in a, in a fragmented way, um, in a duplicated way across the board, eventually this is going to hurt the business. It's going to be creating unreliable experiences. We want the teams to focus on creating the apps. We want to abstract away that network management. So what if, what if we take our code, 
uh, that manages the network, retries the network, enforces security policies, logs and observes all that's happening when we make an outbound request or we receive an inbound request and we extract it away. So we separate that from our service. Now, what if we want to make this particular code that's managing our network, we want to make it portable because we don't want this code to be tied to a specific programming language. We want it to be portable across the board so that if a team wants to build a service in Python, in Ruby, in Golang, in Java, they can do that. And these separate executable, these separate uh, network management executable, if you wish, is going to be managing all of the network concerns for us, regardless on what language or what technology the service is being built. Now, if we did export these as a separate executable, we could also use this for the services that we're not building, but we're using, for example, a database uh, or something that we're downloading and running. Now, for this to work, we need that component, that network management executable to be on the execution path of our requests. We want that component to be able to take over those requests and then proxy them to another service. Uh, the originating service that's making the network request should not be worrying about managing the network because this executable will do it for it. Now, of course, um, because we want the latency, obviously we're adding a new, um, a new component in our requests. Therefore, this component is going to inevitably add some latency, but this is the catch. If the latency is very small, very small, um, in such a way that it doesn't really affect the overall end user experience, but the benefits that it provides are so high, well, then it's still worth adopting it. So to reduce that latency, we're going to be deploying this executable that manages our, um, our network, this proxy effectively, we're going to be deploying it next to our service on the same underlying host, virtual machine, uh, or pod. Basically, we want the connections between the service and the network management to always happen uh, on localhost. We don't want to go outside of the network. Otherwise, we are defining the purpose of, every, of every, having this executable in the first place. We want this to be as close as possible to the services. Um, in Kubernetes, this would be a sidecar container, which effectively is a way to tell Kubernetes to deploy this uh, network management proxy on the same underlying virtual machine as the service that we're running. And because we want to be able to, as part of the tasks that this executable should be doing, we also want to be able to encrypt the connections. We are also going to be having this proxy on the other end when receiving those, uh, those requests in order to enforce encryption out of the box without the services ever knowing that any of this is happening. By doing so, if you look at this picture, we are effectively abstracting away the network management from our services. This means that we can take this code, we can take this executable, we can push it alongside every service, and we can get network management out of the box. The teams that are building the services are never ever going to be worrying about managing the network ever again. All they care about is triggering those requests or being able to receive those requests but how those requests are being secured, how they're going to be observed, how they're going to be retried and so on and so forth, it's not a concern of the service itself. Therefore, we can build services in many languages, in many technologies, and out of the box, we would get network management via, via this portable executable that we're shipping alongside and deploying alongside our services. We can build our own, or we can use something that already exists from the landscape. Um, and uh, if we want to use something that has already been built um, out there that we want to use uh, very quickly, we can definitely use something like Envoy. Envoy is a proxy that we can use for these kind of use cases. It implements network management fu functionality that we can leverage across the board um, alongside our services. So we don't have to build it ourselves. And because Envoy runs as a separate executable alongside our services, all this network management comes out of the box regardless on what platform we're using. 
including containers, but also virtual machines, right? There's nothing about Envoy that makes it very specific to containers and, and, and couldn't, uh, you know, be executed on virtual machines or bare metal even uh, if you want to. It's a portable executable. Now, if we do use Envoy, we don't even have to build our own network management executable because it comes out of the box uh, from the community, from the ecosystem. Now, if we take a step back and we look at the big picture, as we make the transition to microservices, as we introduce more and more services in our architecture, we're going to be having alongside each one of these services that we're creating an Envoy proxy. The Envoy proxy is going to be responsible for processing the outbound requests to another service and receiving the inbound requests from another service. Um, on top of these requests, we can create security, encryption, you know, routing functionalities by leveraging Envoy without having to build them ourselves in our services. Effectively, it's as if we were creating this sort of network overlay. The services are unaware of all the complexities of the network out there, but we're creating this overlay that's been provided by Envoy out of the box, and that overlay will make our network requests more reliable. Now, of course, um, because we're going to be having many instances of our proxy um, of Envoy uh, alongside, alongside our services, it can become challenging to configure the behavior of the network. I mean, the behavior of the network is something that over time we might want to change. We might want to change the permission settings. We, want, we might want to change how we observe our traffic. And every time we make a change or every time we want to expose a new service uh, to another service, we don't want to manually go and push that configuration to all of these envoys. That we could, but that wouldn't be very smart. It would be quite a painful process because we're going to be having a data plane proxy envoy. It's called data plane because it's on the, it sits on the execution on the data path of our requests. Uh, we would have to effectively then manually go ahead and reconfigure these proxies every time we want to make a change. But we don't want to do that. What if we leveraged another component, the control plane, whose only job is to connect with these proxies and push that configuration? The terminology data plane and control plane, um, it's actually quite common in the networking wor world. Um, you know, now we don't manage our own data centers anymore. We use the cloud. But if we did manage our own data center, you know, we would have a bunch of racks and servers sitting in this building. Um, each one of them would have its own switches and routers and so on. And every time we want to change something in, in, the, in the behavior of our network, we don't want to manually, physically, go into the data center and connect to each rack and update the configuration of every switch, for example. We want to be able to leverage a source of truth that's centralized, and that source of truth will be responsible for propagating the configuration to our switches and routers and so on. The same thing is happening here. As we are deploying our data plane proxy across the board, every time we make a change, we don't want to manually do it on every single proxy. We want to be able to leverage a source of truth the control plane that will connect to the data planes to push that configuration. Now the catch here is that the control plane is never on the execution path of the service to service requests. The control plane, it connects to the proxies only in order to be able to push that configuration. The actual service connectivity flows through the data planes, not the control plane. So technically the control plane could be down and if the control plane was down, that would not affect the service-to-service -service traffic. The reason why Envoy is quite popular these days uh, in, in these kind of use cases is because Envoy provides an API that the control plane can implement in order to push that configuration very easily. So that API, uh, the XDS APIs that Envoy provides, come out of the box. And the communication between the control plane and the data plane on Envoy uh, is done via gRPC. Now, likewise, uh, for um, you know, our data plane proxies, we would be deploying our control plane alongside uh, our uh, application so that the control plane can connect to these data plane proxies. And just like that, we have learned what service mesh is. Service mesh is a pattern 
that implies having a data plane proxy running alongside every service that we're running so that the network management can be abstracted away from the services we're building into this proxy. One implementation of these proxies can be Envoy, for example. And then it implies having a control plane that can connect to these proxies so that we can reconfigure the network behavior without having to manually push that behavior into the proxies themselves. So the control plane becomes this source of truth that dynamically pushes the configuration to the proxies. If we want to change the network behavior, we log in into the control plane or we change the state of the resources into the control plane to make that happen. We don't go directly into the proxies themselves. This is service mesh. Um, service mesh is not really a new concern. Um, even in a monolithic world, when a monolith wants to make a request to a database, to something that's outside the, the code base, we have to make a network request. And, and we can use service mesh in a portable way, not just on Kubernetes, but everywhere. There's nothing that, there's nothing that prevents service mesh in this pattern to run on virtual machines, for example, if you wanted to. Um, and also from a pattern standpoint, uh, this is something that we can use, not just for microservices, but for anything else we might be using today. Today, even when a monolith talks to a database, chances are we're managing that network. With service mesh, we can make those monoliths, we can make those services much simpler to build by abstracting that network management to service mesh. This is what service mesh is. Now, likewise, Envoy is an implementation of a sidecar proxy that we can use for managing the network. The control plane also has, uh, there's uh, different implementations out there, each one with, with its pro and cons. And one of them, and the one that we're going to be addressing today is Kuma. Uh, this is the old logo of Kuma. We're updating Kuma with a new logo coming up from uh, the next version. And this is going to be the new logo of Kuma. Kuma uh, is also a, a project that is in the process of being donated to the CNCF um, Foundation as a sandbox project. Last Friday, we opened up, we started the process. Um, you know, it, it's not, there, there is a process to follow, but the goal of Kuma is to be a vendor neutral, open control plane, plane built on top of Envoy. So we're going towards that direction. So let's talk about Kuma for a little bit. Kuma is a control plane, uh, it's open source. It was released in September 10, 2019 by Kong. Um, and uh, it's an Apache license 2.0 project. Um, it's written in Golang um, and it provides a native Envoy integration. So from a technical standpoint, Kuma is a control plane that implements the XDS API so that it can communicate to Envoy. Uh, it has been written um, with, with a very clear design and goal in mind. Um, so first and foremost, Kuma has been built by Kong. And Kong, um, at Kong, uh, we really value the ease of use of the API gateway. We think that simplicity in using the product really is a feature. And service mesh has been very complex for a long time, but it doesn't have to be that way. So with Kuma, we wanted to create something that was simple, that was portable, that was extensible. So Kuma is first and foremost easy to use. It's a very simple, lightweight and extensible control plane that supports Envoy out of the box. It provides policies that we can use out of the box for managing our traffic, for securing it, for monitoring, for observing it. And it comes with support for um, uh, uh, not only multiple platforms, but also for multi-tenancy. So Kuma can be executed on Kubernetes in a native way. And when running on Kubernetes, Kuma will automatically inject the sidecar proxy Envoy without us having to do anything about it. it it's just gonna happen. Um, and, and Kevin will show you later how, how that works. But basically by using Kuma, we don't need to know how to use Envoy. Uh, Kuma abstracts away that complexity so that all that we need to know is how to deploy Kuma and use the policies and that's it. Of course, if we are power users and we want to go deeper and change how the Envoy configuration is being created, well, we can still do that, but it's not required. Kuma comes out of the box with native support for Kubernetes, but also Kuma can run on any other platform. Like I said, there is no reason why service mesh as a pattern cannot be implemented on Kubernetes as well as virtual machines. At the end of the day, if we can manage to deploy our sidecar proxies and we can deploy a control plane, 
the service mesh pattern can be used pretty much everywhere. If anything, if you're transitioning to Kubernetes, implementing service mesh on virtual machines will make it easier for us to transition some workloads to Kubernetes because we're getting rid of one extra concern and that is the network management. We're getting rid of that from the migration process, therefore reducing the surface area of the things that we have to migrate. So if anything, it enables that migration to be smoother because the network has already been taken care for us. So it runs on Kubernetes, it runs on pretty much any other platform, it supports hybrid deployments, and it's quite easy to scale. Kuma is one component, we add more nodes, more replicas if you want to scale it, and we remove them if we don't need as many. It's multi-tenant since day one. That means that, uh, you know, with many other service mesh implementations out there, uh, we need to start a new cluster of Kuma for each line of business or for each team that requires a service mesh. And over time, that becomes operationally very expensive because we do have to then manage, um, you know, all these clusters running. But with Kuma, that's not an issue because we can start one instance of Kuma and then create as many meshes as we want. And then we can determine on our end, if you want those meshes to use the same underlying CA certificate authority for uh, provisioning those identities, or we want to be using different certificate authorities. And all of this is dynamic inside of Kuma. So it's quite simple to get up and running with it. And Kevin will show you in a second, um, you know, what's, what's the look and feel of Kuma. It comes with native CRDs for Kubernetes. It comes with a native CLI that we can use uh, across the board. So we've built this abstraction layer that abstracts away how we are retrieving the Kuma resources on Kubernetes and non-Kubernetes. Um, it provides a GUI out of the box that we can use to get up and running with Kuma. And, and quite frankly, we're making lots of work to make sure that the entry point for Kuma is as easy as possible. Of course, this is a community-driven project. So we are always looking for feedback from the community. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow we have a community call um, on Kuma that if you want, you can attend. Um, you can check out the details for that call on kuma.io slash community. Uh, you can find the Slack channel, you can find all sorts of things, including uh, the information for the community call. And Kuma, again, again, it's community friendly. So um, it's uh, the only control plane built on top of Envoy with an open governance. So there is a journey for contributors to become maintainers of Kuma. Uh, we do have bi-weekly community calls. Like I just said, the next one is tomorrow. Um, and we also are uh, the first Envoy-based control plane that is going to be donated to the CNCF. Uh, so if you want to leave your plus one, that is the CNCF issue that has been opened to kick off the donation process in the sandbox. The velocity of the project is quite high. Uh, we're trying to make, uh, we're trying to learn about the kind of requirements and feedback the users have around Kuma. And we try to keep a quite a good velocity when it comes to implementing our roadmap. Um, we're going to be talking about some of these road, roadmap items in the community call, but um, you know, long story short, uh, there is policies out of the box that you can apply once you deploy Kuma to manage the network, things like traffic permissions, neutral to left, tracing observability, multi-tenancy, uh, fault injections, and so on and so forth. And as part of the roadmap, we're working towards integrating more and more with uh, more complex network deployments so that we can create a mesh that can run simultaneously on Kubernetes and virtual machines uh, as part of that overall picture of transitioning or integrating some of the greenfield um, new things that we're building with the brownfield applications we already have running, as well as we're looking at um, making it easier to manage Kuma with the SMI integrations, with the open integrations, and so on and so forth. So um, these are all items that we are working on with the community and with the community, we prioritize these items depending on how many people want. Simple as that. So this is a small introduction to service mesh, the pattern, and to Kuma, the project. So I'm going to be leaving it up to, to Kevin now to fur up the terminal and see Kuma in action. Kevin, you're there? Yep. Thanks, Marco. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Awesome. And then I'll take over once you're done. Sounds good. All right, let me try to grab the screen share here. And Marco, can you see my screen? Yes. 
All right, thank you. So, hey everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be illustrating, you know, how Kuma works through a demo. And to do that, we built a demo application uh, in order to illustrate how Kuma would run, perhaps in your production environment. So our application here is a marketplace that has sells clothing items, and it's split up into four services uh, to represent, you know, the as you kind of break apart your model, that's how you would kind of distribute your, your, the logic of your application. We have a front end app, which allows you to kind of visualize the marketplace, a back end API built in Node, and then a Postgres and Redis database to store the items in Postgres and the reviews of each item in Redis. So as Marco mentioned earlier, there's various ways you can deploy Kuma and we built out kind of deployment paths for both uh, Kubernetes and Universal for this demo application along with Kuma. But since this is a CNCF webinar today, I'm going to be focusing on Kubernetes. I highly implore you to check out the Universal because I think that's one of the big value propositions of Kuma is how easily you can get it up and running in Universal as well. So everything I covered today here can be found on this Kuma demo repository, which houses just the demo application and the deployment uh, instructions. Uh, you can also just find Kuma on GitHub through Kong slash Kuma without the demo uh, in the back there. So as you can see here, as you follow through the Kubernetes deployment guide on GitHub, uh, everything will be uh, drafted out here uh, and you can navigate it through the table of contents to kind of spare some time and not have you guys watch my containers and cluster spin up. I already have the application deployed. But to illustrate how easy it is, it, it merely is just kubectl apply this manifest that we already have built out that includes the entire demo application across the four services. And if we were to check that and I do kubectl get uh, pods in my Kuma demo namespace, increase the font a little here. There you go. You'll see that I have these four pods up and running and each of them correlate to one of the services that you see up here, right? The back end, the front end, the Postgres, and the Redis. But one thing to notice that within each pod right now, we actually have two containers. And that's because the first container itself is the application. Uh, and the second one is that Envoy sidecar proxy that Marco highlight. That's what's gonna be doing all your network uh, uh, logic that you're gonna abstract away from your application. So cool. we have both, cool and oh, and, to show you how to install Kuma on Kubernetes as well. It's something that I already have installed and up and running. It's merely downloading the Kuma CTL uh, command line enter, uh, tool, and then you use Kuma CTL install control point and pipe that into kubectl. Those two commands will basically get the entire application Kuma up and running on your uh, local machine, uh, local cluster, wherever you choose that, uh, choose to be. I'm having it, I'm ha I have it up and running in Minikube. So let's take a look at what this demo application looks like. I already have a port forward here, as you can see. I'm port forwarding the front end service on port 8080. And if I also navigate there, you'll see, voila, we have a very simple Kuma. We're going to have to update the logo here, obviously. Uh, marketplace. You can shop for horrendously expensive dresses, uh, and you, which the, these are all stored in Postgres service. And then you can look at the reviews, which is stored in Redis. So this shows you that. The entire application is working as we would expect it to. Um, oh, sorry. No. There you go. Lost my mouse there for a second. But this is not enough. As Marco mentioned, by default, the network is insecure and not encrypted, right? All the communication between the front end and the back end, the back end and Postgres or Redis to fetch these items and reviews is not secure. So, how can we make it secure with Kuma? Well, it's very simple. We just have to visit the uh, mutual TLS policy. So I'm just going to jump to that section here. You'll see that all the policies are listed out on the table of contents. So we're going to jump to mutual TLS. So mutual TLS gives you the capacity to uh, add encryption uh, along all your services in the mesh, right? And Kuma ships with a built-in CA, uh, which initializes with an auto-generated root certificate. We also support uh, third-party CAs, and you can uh, configure that by looking at the docs, but today I'm just going to use the built-in CA. So since the mutual TLS is not enabled by default, we have to configure the mesh resource to basically say, hey, we want mutual TLS within this mesh. And how will we go about doing that? It's as simple as updating the mesh CRD with enable true. 
So by default, this is what our mesh looks like, right? This section that I highlight right here, this is what the, the mesh would the research would originally look like without the enable true. So if we, we were to add that additional enable true to our mesh, you'll see that mesh default is now configured and revisit our application. You'll see that the product API now has an issue, right? It no longer has the right permissions to uh, communicate with our backend API. And if you were to access the backend API directly within the container and curl and try to, you know, uh, query one of the Postgres or Redis databases, you'll also get the same issue. You'll, the, the Envoy sidecar proxies will not give you that uh, permission to do so. So very quickly by editing our mesh resource here, we add that, uh, we add that level of security encryption that did not exist by default or previously you would have to build out within each part of your application or each service that you're deploying. Cool. So now that we have neutral TLS enabled, our application no longer works. So we still need to get up and work up, up and running, right? So this is where the next policy comes into place and that's traffic permissions. Traffic permissions gives you the capacity to determine how your service will communicate, especially once you have mutual TLS enabled, you have to specify how you want your services to talk to each other. You can be very granular or very kind of overarching. Uh, let's just kind of apply a very blanket statement, a blanket permission across our mesh. And you'll see here, I'm just gonna say for our traffic permission named everything, I wanna add a spec that says match any source to any destination. Basically saying, I want to allow any source uh, service to talk to any destination it wants. I'm going to go ahead and apply this using kubectl. You'll see that traffic permission, everything is created. And if, let me close this tab. We're going to go back to our application and refresh. The application works again. Because now all these services with mutual TLS uh, enabled have the right permissions to communicate with each other, right? So as an end user, uh, I will not be disrupted at all, but from a networking standpoint, everything is more secure. And that's exactly what we want as we kind of uh, distribute more and more of our services. Before I go on to explore just a few more services, I wanna take a step back and see, you know, we, we applied, we edited our, edited our mesh to enable mutual TLS. We added some traffic permissions. How do I get a better overview of what's happening within Kuma? And this is what, the GUI comes into play. Marco mentioned earlier that Kuma sh ships by default with a GUI, and this is what the GUI looks like. Uh, GUI gives you an easy way to overview. Eventually, we're gonna add more functionality onto it, uh, such as uh, onboarding wizard. But you'll see here that it gives you a capacity to see exactly you know, what our mesh looks like and what our data planes and all the policies uh, we have in our mesh. If I was to click uh, the data planes tab here, you'll see that we have the four data planes online as we have deployed uh, the services across four pods. Each of these services, uh, data planes ca can have a tag and we can uh, eventually do some routing uh, or traffic um, tracing based off these tags. Okay, so let's dive back to policies. We, we I think we applied a very blanket policy earlier, but I think we wanna be more specific, right? We, you're never going to just say we want all services communicate each other. That's I think that's a little bit uh, too broad. So we can start looking into very granular traffic permissions. To do that, let me delete the existing traffic permission we have. So I'm going to delete everything. There you go. And what I'm going to do next is add uh, traffic permissions that basically say, hey, I only want the front end to talk to the back end and the back end to talk to Postgres. You'll see like these two traffic permissions over here. Which, what I'm leaving out here is Redis, right? I'm not giving permission for uh, the back end to talk to Redis. So by that, we should not be able to, um, if I was to uh, apply these permissions and I, I was to try to fetch any reviews, we'll no, you won't be able to see those reviews. So let's go ahead and apply this. Um, as you can see, I'm gonna leave out the Kong front end here. This is another part of this entire demo application that you can explore of how Kong would play into this entire stack. So let me just apply this here. There you go. So I have two new traffic permissions, front end to back end, back end to Postgres. And if we refresh the application, it looks normal, right? You can see that the items on, on the screen. 
But if we were to read the reviews, the reviews, the, the backend API no longer has the ability to talk to Redis without the permission. So this, this is how you can use that granularity to, to lock out services or to, to shut down services you don't want. Uh, awesome. So I just explored adding neutral TLS and traffic permissions. There's a lot more. You can do health checks. You can do uh, um, traffic routing based off tags. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave you, uh, you know, the link later for you to explore these different policies we have built out. But there's one more thing I do want to show you uh, is observability, the ability to kind of uh, see uh, what's happening within all the data planes and all your entire network, right, as uh, traffic flows through it. And this is where uh, Kuma comes into play with Prometheus and Grafana, the ability to do uh, traffic um, metrics using these two tools is really powerful. As you can see, we're gonna go back and use Kuma CTL install to install the necessary Prometheus and Grafana components into our cluster. Unchanged, oh, I actually have everything installed already, so perfect. So if I was to do kubectl get pods in the Kuma, Kuma metrics namespace, we'll have all the necessary Prometheus and Grafana components up and running and it'll be all configured to work alongside Kuma. So uh, this is a really quick way to go about it. Once we have metrics installed, all we have to do is basically revisit that mesh object right here that we have here. Earlier, we, we visited to enable mutual TLS, but now we want to enable Prometheus. Uh, so it, it becomes uh, necessary to include this metrics Prometheus section. And in order to edit this, we're basically telling Kuma, hey, we want to basically send all traffic uh, along our, our Envoy data planes to this uh, Prometheus um, and visualize it using Grafana. Oh, one thing. I noticed that... Oh. I have CA built in. You'll see that this does not have enabled true. So, oh, bummer. Give me a second. There you go. This one will have it. So just now that YAML didn't have enable true. And we enable this. Cool. So you'll see the mesh object default is configured again. We can go back to the, the GUI to make sure it is. You'll see the mesh entity here has the Prometheus section. And by these are the default uh, parameters. You can change this as you see fit. And now if we were to port for the Grafana dashboard, we'll be able to visualize the metrics flowing through our marketplace. But before I do that, I'm just gonna kind of, you know, let's query for some more sundresses, see what the absurd prices we have here are, uh, generate some traffic, read some reviews. We still can't read reviews because we don't have traffic permissions. Um, and now let's go ahead and port for that. Um, that, oh, there we go. Sorry, uh, Grafana pod, there you go. You see all port forward, Kuma metrics. And what, sorry. Um, 3000, right, there you go. Okay, so if we were to access localhost 3000, you'll see our Grafana dashboard. And by default, you log in with admin admin and we'll skip this. And here you'll see three uh, dashboards that we have built out for you. First is the mesh dashboard. So you'll see your overall mesh. Uh, you can see the amount of data planes. Data planes are connected to the control plane, the bytes flowing through Envoy as a whole. All these great metrics are starting to flow in here. But you can you know, dive in more granularly and then look at specifically what's happening within a data plane. Oh, I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna go right through this. So you can look at your data plane metrics based off which data plane you can pick here. And then lastly, you can look at exp explicitly what's happening between two services. So you can choose, I want to see the source of front end to back end and see exactly what's happening between those two. So this gives you a really good way to visualize your network and get uh, observability there. So, okay, Marco, uh, since we're running low on time, we'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I, was, um, I was answering to a few questions in um, in the Q and A in the Q and A section, let me share my screen again. There we go. Can you see it? Yep, looking at it. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, uh, one, one of the questions uh, that's very common uh, that has been asked uh, is how Kuma differs from Istio. So we built, we were looking into Istio to extend Istio and we found that the, there were some fundamental problems with extending, extending Istio that uh, made us want to create a new control plane. One of them is the fact that Istio is not an open project. Uh, it doesn't provide an open governance. It's not being donated. And we needed to have something that we could be contributing on that um, was open. And so that's one of the reasons why we made Kuma open uh, with open governance. And you know, it's the only control plane that supports Envoy that does that. There is some other control planes that are also open and donated, of course, uh, but they're not built on top of Envoy. Uh, the second thing is uh, Istio has been, for some of our users that we've, we've been working with, quite complex to deploy. Um, the deployment modes of Istio uh, have changed in the past, but we decided to provide an easier way to deploy the system since day one, without having to go back on the uh, fundamental architectural decisions we, we made when creating Kuma. Uh, we also work with use cases that are not 100% Kubernetes ready yet. Um, Kubernetes is a journey for many users out there, and some of them are transitioning their VM-based workloads into Kubernetes, or they're building new workloads in Kubernetes, but they still want to integrate them with virtual machines. So we needed a system that could run across all of these different environments and not just for the greenfield Kubernetes um, applications. Therefore, we built a system like Kuma that can run on pretty much anything. It's portable. So it can run on virtual machines, can run on Kubernetes. Uh, we can mix and match. It doesn't really matter uh, as long as the data planes are, are able to uh, you know, retrieve their policies from the control plane. Uh, we've also built an API abstraction layer that allows us to integrate Kuma with CI CD in order to retrieve the resources, uh, the Kuma resources that have been created in an agnostic way by either using the HTTP API as well as the CLI, in addition to the Kubernetes CRD kubectl integration, as well as the GUI. We have also made Kuma multi-tenant. Um, as you know, in Istio, uh, you know, if, if we want to support the entire organization, ideally, um, uh, you know, we would want to have a large mesh for all of the workloads, but pragmatically, different teams are going to be adopting mesh at different times. And in certain industries, especially the financial one, um, they are requesting some form of isolation between one mesh and another. So with Kuma, we can create as many meshes as we want, but we don't have to do that by creating one Kuma cluster for each mesh. So we deploy Kuma once, it's quite simple to use and quite simple to maintain um, across every environment. And we can do all of that from one single control plane. And most importantly, we can do that in a vendor neutral way since Kuma is in the process of being donated to the CNCF. If you have more questions around Kuma, I'll be happy to answer those questions uh, in the Kuma Slack chat, as well as the, in the community call tomorrow. So I'm going to be sharing a few links, um, um, you know, after wrapping up this presentation that you can check in order to get in touch with the, with the core team, as well as ask any questions you may have. Uh, so today we looked at a few things. We are transitioning the way we're building our software from monolithic to microservices. As we do that, as a result to that, we're getting many benefits. We can build software in different technologies. We can deploy them independently, but also we're going to be introducing more and more service connectivity across, across, the, across the board. The network becomes a bigger part of the overall picture and we have to manage the network. Um, we don't want the teams to be managing the network themselves in their own applications. We want to be able to delegate that to a data plane proxy and a control plane that can manage how the network behavior is being enforced. That is Service Mesh. And one implementation of Service Mesh is Kuma. So you can download Kuma from kuma.io, as well as you can check out the uh, GitHub repositories for the Kuma, the Kuma GUI. Uh, the Kuma GUI, by the way, ships already built in into Kuma. So we don't have to deploy a separate component. It's all built in, as well as the Slack channel, as well as Twitter. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I've been answering some Q&A, but perhaps, Kevin, do you want to, do you want to proxy some of those questions to me so I can answer them live? Yeah, so we have one that came from uh, Kalkish. Um, he asked that, Kuma on, does Kuma only work with Envoy? Is there plans to kind of consider other data plane providers? 
Today, Kuma works with Envoy. Um, we, we really like Envoy. Uh, we believe that Envoy has been doing a great job into providing a very solid networking primitive uh, for managing uh, all of these network requests. So Kuma is leveraging Envoy for both L4 and L7 communication. That makes Kuma suitable, not just for, let's say, more traditional HTTP traffic, but Kuma can really be put in front of anything. So we can put Kuma in front of anything that's exposing, that's listening on a TCP port. We can put Kuma in front of databases. We can put Kuma in front of um, log collectors like Kafka. We can put Kuma in front of anything that's using TCP as the underlying protocol. Of course, as, as an extension to that, Kumit also supports gRPC, HTTP, and so on. Um, but really, it can be used for any any source of traffic. So today, we are leveraging Envoy for for these kind of uh, things, and we have not found any limitation uh, in Envoy that prevents us from achieving our goals, which is to create a more um, secure and, and manageable, observable uh, network overlay. Uh, we have contributed back to Envoy in those instances where we needed something that Envoy didn't provide. And the Envoy community has been very helpful and very collaborative with us. So, so far, we're not planning to support other, other data plane proxies, but of course, things change. And so uh, I'll be happy to hear your feedback in the community channels if, if, you, think, if you think that Kum is not doing something that you should be doing, or if, if you have suggestions on supporting other data plane proxies. But so far in the foreseeable future, Envoy is going to be the data plane of choice. Awesome, and um, Marco, we could update the slides real quick. Um, the kuma-mesh.slack is for folks that already joined, so I wanna include the link. Um, I'll just send it out to chat right now. Um, so in order to sign up for the Slack, uh, it's actually chat.kuma.io. Uh, just want to make sure everyone gets that correct link there. And then one last question before we wrap it up since we're out. Oh, actually, we're out of time. So, um, Ariel, do you want to take it from me? Yeah. Yeah. And those links will be sharing. Uh, thank you all for, for joining today. Marco, Kevin, great stuff. Thank you. Excited to hear this project's going to be in the process of getting donated to the CNCF. Um, and great overview with the, the, the ISIO stuff. For those who attended, uh, the webinar recording and the slides will be available today. So those these links, uh, like the chat one and the Slack one, will be available uh, at that time. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today and see you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.